Good evening, everybody. I'm Dan Poole. I'm the publisher of the Pickens Progress. Glad to have you all here tonight. Um, looks like the room is just the perfect size, perfect number of chairs. Um, we were trying our best to abide by the um, various social distancing protocols. Appreciate everybody's cooperation. Ask if you feel like it. If not, it's up at your own risk. Um, we're going to start in just a second. We'll have Larry Cavender. He's been our longtime ball ground reporter and a native of this area. He's going to be the moderator. He will each, he will be asking a few questions to the candidates to kind of set the mood, get things started, and then we will be taking questions from the floor. You can either just raise your hand or walk to the podium, whichever you prefer. We'll wait on Larry to call on you to ask the question. He will also give candidate rebuttal time as it appears that is needed. If it's obvious we need to move on, he's going to move on. If he needs to go back for a rebuttal, he's going to go back for a rebuttal. One thing I would like to impress upon people, we I don't I never like that where people write down questions and hand it to a group and that group screens it because you never know what questions you can get asked. So we're trusting our audience to be civil and asking their questions. And so that we can keep, keep doing it. We've done that at every debate we've had. It's going that way. Questions straight from the floor. It's always worked well before, so I'm sure it will work well again. I would um, just like to point out that these candidates, uh, I've covered county government for years. Nobody seeks the commission chair job because they're hoping to make a lot of money. It's, uh, it's a decent job. It pays well, but it's not your path to riches. You do it because you love the community. These two guys have put themselves out here. Um, they deserve a, a round of applause just because they are community servants who are willing to do this. Let's treat them, be civil when we ask questions, make them questions. This is not the place to give an argument from the floor, so feel free to ask tough questions, but be civil when you ask them. And with that, I will turn this over to Larry for our pleasure and get started. All right. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I, I would like to say before we do it, a pleasure and pleasure and allegiance. Thank you all for coming. It always warms my heart. Uh, I was born in Pickens County to see my neighbors, my fellow Pickens Countyans, come out to an event like this to show you how civic minded you truly are. One thing before I ever speak, at any of my speaking engagements, I always ask veterans to please stand so you can be recognized, you need to be recognized. You're one of the 1% that have fought for us and uh, keep, <clears throat> that way we can keep our freedom subject to you. Are there any veterans here? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and you know, today we will meet the Pledge of Allegiance and I'll remind our veterans that uh, as a result of the Defense Appropriations Act of 2004, I believe, you are now allowed to uh, use a military salute as a veteran or if you're active duty and out of uniform. So if you prefer to use a military salute to the Pledge of Allegiance, you may do so. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hi, I'm Rick Jaspers. It's been my honor to serve you in the Georgia House of Representatives. It's my job to represent your house in the State House. And I ask for your vote in this very important election. I forgot to ask a moment ago, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Hear me just fine? I have been called a loudmouth many times in my life, especially by my ex-wife. Uh, but if you need me to speak a little louder, just give me the good old thumbs up and I'll do that. Uh, I think Dan pretty much went over um, uh, the format. We're going to start with um, opening comments. After that, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Then I'll open up questions from the floor. Uh, if you would like to speak, just raise your hand. I'll recognize you. Uh, make your way to the podium. I believe that microphone is working at the podium, so that way the candidates uh, will be able to hear you, and so will I, because I'm a little hard of hearing, so, yeah. Uh, to start off with, our opening comments, uh, uh, we're going to do it alphabetically. 
Uh, Shouse comes before Stancil. So, Mr. Shouse, you have three minutes for the closing comments. We will reverse that. Thanks for David Shouse. Thanks for putting this on, and thanks for taking the time out of your evening to do to moderate this for us. Uh, I was born in Savannah, Georgia, raised by the state until I was 11, uh, which time I was adopted and moved to Dawsonville. Bought my first house in Pickens County in 1998 at age 18. Since that time, I've lived in Pickens County or within a few miles from the county line. Tasha and I are raising two sons that go to the local schools. They're age 9 and 15. Uh, our 21-year-old daughter, who actually got to join us tonight, uh, lives in the county with her husband and my first grandchild. She works in the public sector, safety sector. Uh, we enjoy travel, sports, and helping others in our spare time. I started a highly successful security company in 2000. The proper planning and success of that company enabled me to survive the Great Recession. In 2010, from the profits of that company, I started buying commercial properties all over the southeast. These properties have, the properties I've bought in Pickens County have never been solely about the money. They have all been developed in the community's best interest. The first, part, the first question I always ask myself when I start to develop something in this community is will this be an asset to the community? It's the first question. It's not about the money. I've resurrected deals like the Pickens County VA Clinic, the DeVita Dialysis Clinic. Not only did I get the projects back on the table, but I successfully finished them. In total, my projects have created roughly 400 jobs with no taxpayer money, no incentives, or no local government help. I entered into politics as I believe Pickens County needs a real change. I believe that all 30,000 citizens deserve to be treated equally and fairly. The government should not be picking our winners and losers. I decided to run as an independent because I'm tired of the party system and a waste of time fighting each other. We also know that there was no way I was getting a fair shot with the local GOP chairman at the helm who has since stepped down. My biggest single business skill is negotiating by thinking outside the box. I've negotiated deals with some of the top CEOs in this nation, Fortune 100 companies, not Fortune 500, but Fortune 100. I now want to use those skills to lead this county to a successful future. We also, I'm sure we will touch on the following uh, during the debate, but one of my biggest assets, single business assets is negotiating and thinking outside the box. I've negotiated, excuse me, got mixed up there. I'm sure we will touch on the following during the debate, but some of the things I plan to work on with Ms. Denny and Mr. Barnes are creating fiscally responsible budgets, which include working towards eliminating the TAN, expanding our economy, making sure we are bringing the right industries here for the right reasons, fire EMS and public safety, making sure we have the right equipment and are paying appropriately, expanding our parks and recreation, making sure we're revenue producing and appealing to all citizens, Relocating the animal shelter, expanding and creating the infrastructure, which includes water, sewer, internet, and roads, the airport, using, utilizing it as an asset, and transparency. You can go ahead. Mr. Stashen. Well, I just want to say thank you to everybody that came tonight. Thank you to the Progress for hosting this, uh, this event. I've been fortunate to grow up here in Pickens County. I attended school here at Pickens County. Uh, attended all the way through high school. Uh, my parents ran a business in, in Jasper growing up, so I had an opportunity to get to know many, many of the, the citizens as a child and, and staying active and, uh, and involved in civic and in sports. I uh, attended college after graduating. I went to Valdosta State. And it's kind of funny to be running for county commission chairman right now because my reason for picking Valdosta State was because it was as far away from Jasper <laughs> without leaving the state of Georgia so that I could pay in-state tuition. Like most of our teams, I think, or most teams in small towns that are just looking for more activities and more things to do, that was me. Uh, my goal at that time was to get as far away as I could. When I was there, I met my wife. We got married, and shortly after, we were able to move back to Jasper because my priorities at that time changed. I started to look for where can we raise a family in a safe neighborhood? Where can we get to know our neighbors? Where can we ensure that we've, we're, we're growing up and we're raising our family in a safe community? Uh, throughout my career, I've spent the majority of it in public safety. I started off as a police officer, uh, went to work for the state for a while. I got to spend a, a time at the Chamber of Commerce. I spent several years working for the Chamber of Commerce 
at the time was a separate entity from economic development. And I know that, that some communities have those merged together, but the county at the time had an economic developer that I worked alongside, which is where I originally started coming up with the idea of getting more involved and more active in, in serving my community. It's also a time when I met, uh, at the time, Tom Graves, who was running for representative. He was running to serve as our, our state representative and spending a lot of time in Jasper and spent a lot of time coming in. And he's just recently retired from the U.S. Congress. And it, it, he, in his farewell address, he made a comment that it really sums up a lot of the reasons why I wanted to be involved. He says in his farewell address, I want to share that the most essential lesson learned over the past decade is the importance of relationship building. Tone, rhetoric, and civility are crucial to opening doors and new and unexpected relationships with lawmakers across the political spectrum. I think he really set the tone for what, what I've been constantly wanting to reach out. I think that relationships and being able to work together is the key for us to be able to move forward. I know as we've seen changes in the city of Jasper, we've seen new leadership come in, we've seen new opportunities that they've came in with. Um, the opportunities for economic development have skyrocketed. We also have had the, the new joint effort by the city and the county working together to where we can start moving forward for economic progress. And I look forward to being a part of that and trying to fight for what we can to, to build a better future. Not just for us, but for our kids and for their kids and for generations to come. Okay, at this time we'll uh, begin our uh, questions. Uh, I will say this, I'm sort of played with Chris Wallace tonight, uh, but unlike him, if you're in the middle of a good point, I will not cut you off, both of you, okay? Uh, I will, we do have a two minute limit on the answers, but you know, if you run over a little bit, I might cheat a little bit the next time and take a little time away from you. Uh, Mr. Poole is keeping time and he will signal you, but uh, I will let you finish your thoughts if at any time you think we moved on too quickly, not like Chris Wallace, <laughs> raise your hand if you'd like to go back and cover something as well, okay? Two minutes for a response uh, to the question, and then a minute for a rebuttal. Uh, if you need a little more time, I'll give you that time, okay? All right, the first question, I'll direct this to Mr. Stansel. In terms of economic development, Give us some examples of the type of growth you would like to see. If you could wave a magic wand, what we would look like? Blue Ridge or Riverstone Parkway? Or possibly some other community? Would we have more housing, more businesses? And how would you encourage new business and industry to come to town? Yeah. Um, so I think that going to the middle of the question first, when you when you talk about that we want to look like Riverstone or Blue Ridge, I don't think we really want to look like either. I think we want to look like Jasper and Pickens County. I think we want to create what fits for our community. I don't think that we need to just try to mirror one community over another. I think that Blue Ridge and, and Fannin County has done an outstanding job with the way that they've built up their tourist market. They've brought the businesses that are necessary, but if you speak to the residents in Fannin County, about how they feel about what's happened in Blue Ridge, they're going to tell you the same things that people in Pickens County would if we developed that much traffic in the city of Jasper. So I think we've got to be careful, we've got to be cautious to make sure that we're doing controlled, smart growth, that we're actually trying to find businesses that will help create jobs, that create better futures, that we're doing to fight for those businesses to come into the community. But at the same time, making sure that we don't lose what we have. A lot of people have picked this not only because they were born and raised here, a lot of others have chose to move here because of the same reasons. They want the small town atmosphere. They want to be able to know people by name when they walk into the store. So it's a delicate balance of trying to manage that tension of creating opportunity and creating economic growth and creating a more balanced tax base to where it's not all on the burdens of, of the shoulders of, of your taxpayers that own homes, but that you're spreading that out over your commercial property as well. So I think that if we can find ways to find clusters of industry that can come in that do not draw a ton of resources, that do not drain a lot from our infrastructure, then that can create opportunities. I've been working with Jeep Fest for years and years. I got to know a lot of vendors and manufacturers from throughout the entire country that make parts specifically for Jeeps, that, that we've already got a welding program in our tech school that's training people to do the jobs that they have. So if we start getting the opportunities and start finding ways to connect those 
individuals, those clusters with our property owners and with our developers, then we can start creating those jobs and those opportunities. Okay. Mr. Schaus? Yeah, Pickens County is unique. Uh, I think everyone enjoys this small town feel, the beautiful countryside. We have some geographic things that really limit what we can do. Um, you know, if you want a flat spot to build, it costs a lot of money coming from my development side. I'd like to see, uh, first thing is we got a few hundred kids graduating high school every year. And I know that we're all close-knit families and we like to keep our children home. We're not creating jobs for those kids where they can actually be on, you know, totally independent from mom and dad. We've got to bring in, my plan would be to bring in, uh, instead of manufacturing, I really want to bring in distribution. North Georgia's booming everywhere. We got Bartow County, Dawson County, Hall County, Fan and Union. They've got to have supplies and we are the stopping point. I've talked to numerous, numerous uh, distribution companies that want a place right here in Pickens. People say, well, you can't do it. We don't have the infrastructure. Well, distribution doesn't take infrastructure like manufacturing does. You don't need all the water. You don't need all the sewer. All you really need sewers for is their bathrooms. Um, there's two big companies that want to come right now. One of them is the Brown Company, we all know. Um, they need food companies. They need places to restock these grocery stores that instead of running it up from Fulton Industrial or Ottawa, Tennessee, they need to be here where they run the big trucks and then the little trucks. With that kind of uh, diversity in the uh, distribution jobs that we create, you're going to start seeing, instead of this 55 and up, uh, housing projects that we see, you're going to start seeing some housing that's affordable to these kids um, and our, our 20 and 30 year olds. Right now, I know if you go up and down 515, which is what everybody says they don't want, all we see is 55 and up communities being built. That doesn't do our children any good. doesn't do our future families any good. So they're forced to move to Canton. They're forced to move to LJ away from their families. Um, my next plan would be Parks and Rec. We are a stopping point. Everyone wants to go to North Georgia. Everyone. They want to go to Fannin County, do zip lines, do the Carter's Lake. So if we can build on top of that with Parks and Rec, which the average... Yeah. Go ahead. Do you need another moment or two? 30 seconds. 15. <laughs> The, the, average travel, <laughs> the average travel ball family spends $1,000 a week right now on extracurricular for travel ball players. That is a lot of money that we could bring in, and guess what? When the tournament's over, they go home, but we got their money. And they can go up to the neighboring communities on, on the other, you know, their off days to spend money. Thank you. All right, the next question I'll first uh, direct to Mr. Schaus. Do you believe there is a good old boy system in our local government that is creating an unethical and corrupt environment? If so, how do you plan to change this and prevent further wrongdoing? I believe there's some favoritism, there's some unequality. Um, I've experienced some of it. I've, I've came in, I, I've seen, I've asked to do things, uh, people, why, or so-and-so is going to do that later. Um, I have heard of deals that we were going to do that, and it's not the county so much, it's more, it was a different a municipality. You know, they call the developer and say, why don't you use so-and-so's property? And this came straight from the horse and that's just not right. The government should not be picking whose property you buy or, you know, some of the finer points they're trying to choose on these businesses. If the Zoning works out for a piece of property. It doesn't matter what your name is, how much money you're worth. You have the right to do that with your property as long as it's not a blight on somebody else. So, yeah, I think to some point there is some bias um, based on how long you lived here, based on how much money you have, based on whose pockets you're padding. Uh, I just don't participate in it. I'm strictly business. I don't care who you are, how long you lived here, what uh, social clubs you participate. It's all about business to me and get to a point where I can lower every citizen's taxes in this community and set the future path to success. Mr. Stanfield? So that, growing up here, I, I know historically, yes, I would say that there has been, been a good old boy system at times that have played out. I, I, it's, it, anybody that's been here your entire life would, would be able to say you could point back to examples of stories of roads being paved and church parking lots being paved during election times and, and those kind of stories that exist. I don't believe it's strong, and I don't think that it's, I think it's so loosely defined at this point. 
I think part of, of what gets blamed on good old boy is just good relationship building sometimes. I mean, it, 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 yes, I do know a lot of people that live in the community. It doesn't mean I'm going to give favoritism to a soul, but it means that I do have a relationship and may pick up the phone and give that person a call. So those are things that I think you've got to clearly define. If it's unethical, as the question said, then I'm 100%. I think that we've got to make sure that every single opportunity is given not only clearly, but transparently, it needs to be fair, it needs to be consistent, it needs to be clearly communicated. So the rules need to be the same for all. The, the rules need to be the same if you're in developing or if you're building a home. The rules need to be held the same for everybody that's doing it. It's not something that should ever be modified and changed. And I think that that's the negative impact of when you refer to a good old boy system is when that side gets brushed just because of a relationship or who you know. I don't think that exists to the degree it has in generations past, but I do believe that there are still echoes and shades and, and, and rumors of, of that still going on, and uh, there's just no place for it. That's, that's something that's got to go. As far as knowing people and building relationships, I'll, I'll fight to do that till, till the end of my career, nonstop. So I 100% I stand behind that. Uh, don't want to dominate the whole evening from this end. So I'm going to see if any of you have questions that you would like to ask. As Bishop Poole said a moment ago, uh, if you would like to ask a question, raise your hand. I will recognize you. And if you'll make your way to the podium and uh, uh, direct a question to whichever candidate you wish. Anyone in the audience have a question? Right, I've got a lot, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess what I really would like to ask right now is um, my husband and I live on the other side of the county, over near the preserve, which is off of Salem Church Road. And I'm speaking only from personal experience, but I've talked to a lot of neighbors. We all have trouble with our internet, okay? And I'm just curious as to whether or not either of you have any plans to maybe solicit more companies, internet companies, to come in. Because um, we're on TV, well, I shouldn't say <laughs> who we're on, but um, they haven't upgraded their system and kept up with the growth. And there's been a good bit of growth over there. So I'm just curious about that. Mr. Stanchel, you want to answer first? Sure. Okay. So I, I 100 percent I've already spoke to two of the companies. I've spoke to ETC and I've also spoke with Windstream to talk about plans and what they're looking at to try to do to move forward. Uh, ETC has been developing a plan to try to push out and move further into the, uh, the high-speed network in different parts of the county, but they want to have a limited number, to have a specific number of customers in the area before they'll move there. The other two companies that service two areas, I know that you, you referenced one TDS services one side of the county and we have Frontier serves another, and then the complaint from both ends has been speed, has never kept up with the times. I believe you've actually commented on your page that you live in an area that's serviced by one of those companies as well. So it, I think the more we continue to meet, it is a free market, it's a capitalist market, and so they're able to come in, but I know that one advantage we've got going right now is the state has really started to push legislation to push high-speed internet into rural areas. Because we're, we're dealing with it in parts of our county, but several counties, especially in South Georgia and rural farmland, are experiencing it countywide. They, they've got no option. They, they've got a, a satellite dish is the only option that they have, which is the equivalent of a, a dial-up speed from 1990. So I think that as the state's pushing that legislation through, it's going to free up state funds to be able to help build that infrastructure up. They're going to start making it more possible for that to happen. One of the reasons in some of the areas is because of the limited number of houses and the limited number of customers that have came and stepped forward to say they'd be willing to sign up. It's like anything else. If they've got the customer base in place, then they'll start to they'll start to build it up. And I know Frontier started to push things over to the extreme west end of the county to, to beef up their speed. So I do 100% I do think that that's a, a key element for economic development. I think for people working from home, we've learned during this pandemic, the number of people that have opportunities to work from home, you can't if you don't have decent internet speed. You can't participate in Zoom calls if it's freezing and shopping every single time. Students in, in dealing with the same thing. So. Mr. Schaus, your response? So you live over in the TDS sector, and I've spoken to them directly. Uh, one of my problems with them is they still charge for a phone line just to have your DSL, which they try to tell you is the law, but it's not. Um, I've talked to them at length about getting rid of that. We've made some progress. 
Uh, Rick Jaspers has done an absolute fabulous job um, working with the state in some of these areas that Chris was talking about, <coughs> pushing high speed. But what a lot of people don't know was when we built the VA, at and is up here now. at and ran a line from Canton all the way up here, and it's sitting over at the shopping center. And they are working right now behind the scenes to start distributing that trunk line. I know we got the big fiber running on the railroad track, which is kind of a whole nother deal dealing with right-of-ways and stuff. But AT&T brought their own fiber up here. One of the things we can do to speed the process of getting you higher speed internet is when we're running utilities, water lines, power lines, things like that, is partnering with the uh, utility companies and making sure we're dropping fibers in those same ditches. We do that a lot. Uh, I'm doing a big uh, project down in South Georgia, and that was part of the, the county kind of ordered the developer to make sure that we drop those lines in. So then it's very, very cheap to do it at the same time. Uh, so we made sure we dropped those in the lines. But I'm one of the, you know, there's some legalities and stuff we can't do, but I'm absolutely for getting us the fastest speeds we can. Um, my sector of my professional line work is that a lot of the people that we used to service in their businesses, they're not going back. They're going to be working out at home. That's just the way it's going to go. I saw a couple other hands. Uh, yes, yes, ma'am, you go. Ma'am, you go and, and uh, that, you go to the podium. And ma'am, if you want to, in the interest of time, since it takes a while to walk up to the podium, if you want to go uh, stand uh, behind the first lady, uh, we'll just get you come out of it. Of course, social distance. <laughs> I wanted to ask both you gentlemen if you're comfortable with keeping this as a three-man commission. You, you don't have any plans, either of you, do you, to expand this, or do you think there's a need to expand to maybe the four- or the five-man commission? Uh, I believe last time Mr. Stanton was responded first. Mr. Chairman. You're Charles. comfortable keeping it at three, are you? I actually had looked at doing the five man, which the voters voted for three, and after uh, spending a lot of time with uh, the current commissioners, they changed my mind pretty quick on that to stay with the three. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I'm, I am for somewhere down the line is perhaps a county manager. Uh, county managers are very well educated and the law, the grant processes, and they usually st stick straight to the law and just do what the commissioners up, uphold or pass down to them. And people have this thing, well, it's going to cost us more money. It probably will cost us a little bit more money, but you got to remember that the chairman's pay is going to drop dramatically. But I'm fine with a three, three commission. What's up, Chris? I, and we, we've talked about this at length in a, a previous debate here in the, the run against uh, against Chairman Jones in the primary earlier. I, I believe that a five person makes more sense because of one simple fast, uh, one one simple reason. And the only reason I would say that is it's easy to get two against one. And, and if you think back to, to school, there's if you have two votes needed. One person's able to sway one person, and you have a vote. If you have five people, you bring in different thoughts, different mindsets, and it's you have to actually be more diplomatic in how you go about things. I think the three person is working well now. I think that what we have in place is working for us. Before moving to a, a, a county manager, I would like to see us revisit the possibility of, of a five person. But it the same the same way that we did this one. Put it before the vote, let the voters choose, and let them understand what it would be. You're looking at, at the difference of, of twenty four thousand uh, dollars would be the amount to add two more commissioners to the to the county, versus if you hired a county manager, you're looking at the possibility of trying to increase that by eighty, ninety to hundred thousand dollars. I'm looking at so. the city of Jasper right now. And what kind of a mess they're in for their tax taxes going up the way they are. So, and I'd be interested to know how that meeting went. I know it's going on as we speak. So um. I have also another question too, Mr. Stevens. To yes, I would like to say I agree with Chris on that. Is that the and I, that's that was my main reason originally going to five because if you've got one person in your pocket going back to a good old boy, whatever you want to call it, then the third one really doesn't even matter. Uh, I think we would have to have some town halls. We'd have to have some. I think it would take legislator to vote again, uh, 
and it's something down the road that we could consider. I don't know if it'll be in his, his and my time, but we could certainly look at it because the only, one thing I do like is that you take 15,000, when you split the county into two, you only have 15,000, each one represents 15,000 people, but by going to five, now you've got you know 7,500 per commissioner and then your chairman sitting there. So something down the road, it can put nothing in the near future. Mr. Chancellor, would you like to hear anything? I think we both agree on yeah. that. Well, I have one so. more question for Go Mr. Stansel. Yes, ma'am. Now, I understand you've had a long career, fairly long career, in association with the Sheriff's Department here. And I used to get very ticked off at seeing the budget. I mean, it would come out, and I'd get up here and talk to Ralph Jones about it. And he would tell me that he had no control over whatever budget came in from each department. He had to just negotiate and deal with people that were running that department. And I've seen a tremendous increase in the budget in the department of the sheriff's office. I've lived here for as long as he's been in office when he was first running and I voted for him. First thing he did when he got into office, he needed new cars. He needed new employees. He needed more equipment and he needed everything. Even in the lowest economic um, times, when Fannin, White County, and um, Gilmer County were keeping their taxes at a level with no increase, the department, the sheriff's department was always over budget and going higher. And ever since he's been in office as our sheriff, we have had a tremendous amount of increase in our budget. Ma'am, your question? And my question to you is, will you be able to since you have had a close association with the deputy, I mean the sheriff, will you be able to try to work with him and tell him that this is on the taxpayer's back and we need to be reasonable with budgets and try to hold back on yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I believe it's a fair question, and I have worked there for, for a significant amount of time. Yeah. The sheriff and I, as I've mentioned before, when I talk about relationship building, have the kind of relationship that we can sit down and agree to disagree. We can we can go back and forth. They, the one thing when you talk about talking to Chairman Jones, there are a lot of things in state law for constitutional offices that the commissioners do not have the authority. They, they can set the budget, they can refuse, they can do what they need to do, but the sheriff then has the recourse opportunity to challenge if it's something that he can show the public that, that is there. I'm not here to defend him, I'm not here to defend anything in particular as related to the sheriff's budget. What I will say is that we've got the kind of relationship that we can sit down. My one commitment to the sheriff uh, throughout this entire campaign and even before doing, deciding to run, mm -hmm. was to offer him a seat at the table during the budget process so that we can all sit around the table together, that each elected official is brought in early in the process so that we can sit down and discuss the needs, look at what can be put off long term, what can be used through SPLOS tax, so that we can have a long range plan rather than just the upcoming year's budget, but that we can be looking at two years, three years, four years, so that we're prepared to deal with what we're dealing well, with. Well, that's what I was so, interested in, that you could work with him yes, and try to get him to be reasonable at times with the budget that's been right. going overboard. Mr. Thank Strauss, you. would you like to comment on that as well? Uh, the only thing I'll say is, like Chris says, you got to welcome all elected officials and all the department heads that come in to work on these budgets is very important. Uh, personal indifferences aside, we've got 32,000 people we've got to serve and get the best service that we can to them, whether it be the sheriff, whether it be medical, uh, fire, whatever it is. Uh, but I would like to put something together with the CFO and make sure that we're showing taxpayers what all the real money is being spent. Because there's other uh, monetary contributions that they're getting through SPLOSC and stuff that some of the taxpayers don't show. And this goes to all departments. So everyone knows what everybody's really getting because sometimes the budget lines aren't painting what they're getting. And sometimes the budget lines aren't painting everything they're spending either or they're reimbursing things that are going into the general fund or things like that. So it, working with the department heads, making sure they have the money they need is, is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, if you'll step to the podium, and if you'll hold off one second, does someone else in the audience like to ask a question? So raise your hand. Ma'am, if you'll go over here, social distance behind this other lady. Hi there, I'm Susan Horton, I'm a business uh, owner and a resident of Phoenix County. Been here about 11 years. 
And I guess uh, with the lady that y'all spoke about has been touched on a little bit, but I'd like to ask it again. This is a question for both candidates. I, I believe one of the reasons that Mr. Jones lost his re-election bid this year was when the public was made aware of the county credit card that Mr. Jones was using for private meals and even some at out-of-county restaurants. Mr. Jones claimed that since he's also a county manager, he used a county credit card for meetings. Since Mr. Trump was a chairman, commissioner, and county manager, he has no oversight or accountability to answer to, I believe. So I feel like a lot of, a lot of other residents in Pickens County that the commission board chairman should be separated from the county manager's duties to allow more accountability on how our taxpayers' money is being spent. Pickens County should have a non-biased board of commissioners. My question is, if you're elected, what is your timeline and plans to hire a new county manager? Thank you. Mr. Strauss, would you respond first? Well, first of all, it's not just me. We've got two other commissioners. Uh, so there's, there's a lot that's going to go into that when the times come. Uh, I think there will be a time. I don't know if it's two years, four years. I don't know if after four years, people may tell me I'm doing a terrible job and I might not run again. I don't know. I know it hates the max. But when the time's right, we'll look at it with the other two commissioners. And we may have two different commissioners at that time. I just don't know. Um, so, it, we'll just have to work with what, we're, what, we're, what we get. That's just what we're going to do on that. So, I, I, I don't see it being an immediate thing. Uh, I, I, just from a budget standpoint alone, I think that you would have such a significant bump that's required. I think that the Board of Commissioners is overseeing what's going on. I think the more that we're transparent, the more we can share. When it comes to the credit card issue, I'll just go ahead and tell everybody point blank, I don't want a credit card. I don't want a county credit card. If, if the county has to have one locked in the safe, I'll check it out if it's ever going to be used, but I definitely don't want one that I'm carrying. If you see me buying somebody's lunch, you're watching me buy somebody's lunch. So that's not an issue that I, I look to face. What I've tried to do in trying to prepare is to go through the training and the certification that's the same for a county manager. County and city managers go through the Carl Benson Institute to become certified public managers where you study budget process, performance evaluation, all the different management aspects. And so I've tried to spend the time that I could to be prepared for that part of the job as it exists now. If the board were to come in and say that they wanted to change that, it would have to go before legislation because it would be changing the law of how the county is governed. So we would have to bring in and get our state legislature back involved as far as getting that bill reintroduced so that we can try to get that changed. It's not as simple as just voting on it in a, a commissioner's meeting. It would require it to go to go to the state to make that change. So I don't see it being an immediate thing. I do think that we eventually will be there. I, I, I think as our county grows, we will eventually be there. But I don't think it would be something I'd want to burden the taxpayers with trying to add that extra line item on them right now. I guess I would, can I say one more thing? I yes. guess it was just very upsetting to the citizens to find out that uh, that since a county manager is is also allowed to do past vendors and stuff, it's very hard to control it. And I guess that's what really upset it more, that if, since you have free reign, what would you do to stop that? as a county manager and you're voting on same, some of the same spenders, stuff like that. It just doesn't leave you unbiased. Oh, I, I, I agree. I, I think that it's back to transparency. It's back to, to giving the CFO the ability to at every meeting give all the information, not just the budget line items, but if it's something that they want to attack a commissioner for the way that they're spending money, I think that the CFO has to have that authority to be able to be public with all expenditures. And I know that's probably not a position she would feel comfortable with right now, but I think that there could be ways that we could find to do it that would be transparent, that would make sure that we're held accountable 100% to the taxpayers. I, I believe in accountability 100%. So, so we've had a chairman that served this county for 16 years. It's already going to be a pretty good change, no matter if Mr. Stanton wins or I win. And to try to even fathom putting a county manager in the mess, in the same mess, is, it's just not the right time. Part of being accountable is being transparent. And one of my plans is, I know there's certain things we can't post legally, but there's a lot of stuff, bank account records, receipts, etc., that can be uploaded every month into public share files on our county website. 
Because if you think about it, without an open records request, a lot of this stuff wouldn't have been revealed to you. So one of the biggest things we can do is transparency. There's no reason that every credit card statement, every bank statement, things like that are already redacted and put online for you to see every month for the ones that want to see it. Thank you, ma'am. Next up. And while she's coming to the podium, is there anyone else who would like to get in line to speak, ask a question? No one else? Okay, ma'am. I'll start off. Y'all don't hate me for this question. <laughs> um, it's really for you, Chris. Okay. Um, oh, Mr. Spencer, so sorry. Um, there's been a lot of stuff being said about the Jeep class. Mine's more of a legal question. <coughs> And with you working for the sheriff's department, I mean, Donnie was going to get with me, message me, was going to talk, but it, both of us has been busy and haven't been able to do that. And I'm sure with all the emails that you have sent, I know you participate, a lot of people do. Um, I don't know of the exact times that you did, but I'm sure some of them were during the day. <clears throat> it's a nonprofit organization, that's what it is. Okay, my question is, because the way I, I, I'm taking it is, <clears throat> it was on, well, you were on salary at the sheriff's office on their time, but you were doing it for the nonprofit, which you may have, I think there was a timesheet too, when the G-Fest was actually going on. My question is, if anybody else for the county was helping a nonprofit organization or even running, a, running one, trying to raise money for an organization, on the county's time, would that not be the same thing as them getting in trouble because they're not doing their job and could be held, like maybe lose their job or getting written out? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I, I understand what you're saying. And to the legalities of it, if somebody was to get hurt, I mean, I know there's a waiver that signed and all that at the Jeep Fest, but if somebody got hurt because the way people are, I hate to say this, but money hungry, they try getting a lawyer or see somebody right. over something little. If you were on the county's, oh, sorry, the county's time and it referred back to you or your name or somebody else, yeah. that would cost the taxpayers money too. I, I think part of it's understanding, and, and, and this is the difficult thing with open records. Sometimes you get one fact, but you don't get the full story. So the, the number of emails, for instance, that I think it was 5,000, 500 and something you may have it written down exact but yeah. there was 5500 I use a program called mail merge where I'll type one email and send it out to all registered participants and then it sends it to over a thousand in one email so in the, in the context of I think three emails over half of that was in three emails that were typed as a salaried employee I work day and night I, I, I know if you, you were to talk to my family I'm not at home at all for months when it's Jeep Fest time because I will spend sometimes during the daytime working on Jeep Fest but then go back in the evenings working on the sheriff's office I don't have a set number of hours schedule I'm an exempt salaried employee that's hired to do the job that I'm hired to do and so the hours vary every single week so as far as the time and when I was doing one versus when I was doing the other, they went back and forth during that season. I went back and forth constantly uh, with trying to organize it. I put it on for, for I think, seven of the nine years. I, I don't remember the exact number, but I mean, I've been the organizer for, for year after year after year. So separate those two. It's something that the county and the city and all these others, the Marble Festival, if you go and pay attention to setting up with the grounds, the county and the city participate in helping with preparing those things. The sheriff's office has also been down there to try to help with taking the inmate work detail to go on, on government property to, to be able to, to do things. It's things that have been done to, to, to help our community for, for years and years and years. This isn't something that's been here. It's something oh, that I know. Jeep Fest just grew. Jeep Fest is one of those things that if it was a small event, people weren't really paying attention, but it grew into a very large event. And so it started to draw more attention. It's, it's, it, we, we went through and checked with, with all legality. We checked with uh, attorneys prior to. The attorneys were a part of trying to set up the waivers. The attorneys were a part of trying to make sure that the event itself had separate insurance that was there. The one time there's been a lawsuit, it was for a law enforcement issue. So that event would have hired an off-duty law enforcement officer that would have, would have led to that in the first place. So um, it was separate. Sorry. Mr. Shouse, would you like to have a couple of minutes to give your, your side of the issue? Yeah, uh, 
First, I applaud Chris for the event that they put together in Jeep Fest. It does a lot of great things for this community, uh, brings in economic uh, things for all our local businesses. A lot of people have read a lot of things that were written to persuade that I'm not for charity and I'm not for children, and that's just not true. What I am for, however, is you've got to separate private from the government. It's just the bottom line period. If I decided to start sending, and it doesn't matter if it's a nonprofit for the children or not, the law is the law. If I decided to send 5,507 emails from a county server to run my security company or utilize county employees to do things, I'm breaking the law. And I promise you they'll throw me under the jail. So it's not the event. It's we have to make sure that we're separating any legal, legal problems or any kind of problems that can be caused by commingling those things. The other thing is you can't tell me I, I've got we do work on some charity events in our companies and when we work on those whether it was for a local child here or a child down in Atlanta it takes a tremendous amount of time from what our focus is which is in our companies making money and our government or in our sheriff's department or our water department it's performing other tasks so I just have a problem with it being co-mingled that's the only problem with it I don't have a problem with the event, in fact, I want to have more events. Uh, I don't care if we have Commissioner's Oyster Fest, Commissioner's Beer Fest, Commissioner's Rod Run. I want to have a lot of stuff to bring things up here, but we've got to make sure that we're not giving any kind of doubt to our taxpayers. And it, it just starts with some simple things, I think. Is there a possibility to Yes. Uh -huh. So in today's a prime example. I received an email from the Girl Scouts of America wanting me to line up to have a deputy that could come and participate in something off duty to allow them to get a civic duty. So if we start taking that approach to where we can't go legal, a large part of my job is working with nonprofits all of the time, whether it's the Boy Scouts, whether it's the Girl Scouts, whether it's a hospital event, whether it's one after another requesting that we line up something. And so they're, they're emails, they're phone calls, they come through, and it's a frequent daily thing, not just with the Pickens County Sheriff's Office, but it's, it's law enforcement everywhere. So it's a big part of our job. Just because the number of emails increased and the scope of the size of that event, it's a daily thing with being the person that's in charge of community relations for the, for the office. It's, it's something that goes on in every Sheriff's Office with those events. This one just grew and it became large. We never commingled a penny as far as funds. Deputies are paid through the Sheriff's Foundation for coming out and working traffic and security for being off duty. I'm a salaried employee that volunteers the extra hours that comes out and there's other salaried employees that volunteer their extra hours to come out. So there's, there's, I know that the term commingling keeps getting used and I understand that because we do work in that office but our jobs are still being done. So I, I think that it, it's it's one of those things that I'm not going to sit and try to defend. I understand there's a different side to this coin, and I get it. But I think that if you have to understand that in order to take that away, you take the event away. Because if you take that away and you take away the organization side and you start having to pay separate salaries for the individuals that put those things on, not just the volunteer overtime that we're doing on our own time, but the, the separate salary, then you eat up all profits. The profits for trying to do it become so small that it would not be a, product, a productive event to take care of the community. So it's it's kind of a catch-22 situation with, with how that goes. Mr. Shroud, So, yeah, I mean, a Girl Scout calling for a, a car or whatever to tour to lead something is a whole lot different than 5,507 emails with the county sheriff's department's phone number to call for any questions. That, that's a huge difference there and I mean all these vendors and things calling that number on our this you can try to vouch all you want but it's not right and you just said that if you did it right then you would have no profits you literally just said that if you used all the resources not on the taxpayers especially when you have even members of the public saying that they do use our fuel they do pay deputies to go watch the inmates clean up. So does that mean when I have my private event, you're going to send the inmates to come clean up? I'm not allowed to respond. 
So you twisted my words just a little bit. My words were not that if you do it right. I said when we're volunteering to do the effort afterwards. To do it right and you take away the volunteer time that we're putting on beyond the job that we're already doing. I'm a salaried employee. I don't get paid any extra to do my job. I do my job and then continue to work. And that's where the timesheet, which is really just a log that's kept on my desk, showed that it was 90 hours a week. That doesn't even show everything that was there. That shows a portion of the hours that were there in order to pull that off. If you're paying somebody a salary to pull that off, then you're not going to be able to put off the event without the profit. The land where the Jeep Fest is at is leased through the Development Authority for Pickens County. It's, it's leased as county land during the time of that event. That's the reason for the inmates being on the property while they're there, so that we can put on something that works for our community. The fuel is purchased by the Sheriff Foundation. They have a credit card or a debit card that's used to purchase fuel for the vehicles and for what's used while they're setting it up. So the Foundation goes and refuels those things while it's running. So, they're not as commingled as what you believe it is. And I understand that you've got enough information that it does appear that way, but you don't have the interpretation of what you've got. You've got the data, but without any ability to interpret what you've got. So it requires more to understand what all is there. And then simply coming in and sitting down and reviewing it would have easily answered any questions. Using it for political gain to try to attack me was a whole other story. I didn't interest in fairness. So would you like yeah, uh, actually, I never attacked the event. I never attacked the call. I attacked the time you're putting to it. And you can try to pull the wool over everyone's eyes. But being in business for 22 years and making a lot of money, I know what employees are doing when they're not doing the tasks they're hired to do. So, I mean, we can agree to disagree on this one. Like I said, the sheriff, you guys do a fabulous job putting it together, but you've got to separate it from the taxpayers, especially when, I think one thing you've learned and I've learned is people are very, very um, confused on how the government works and who's responsible for what, and your commissioner's office is getting calls that, you know, that the sheriff's over budget. Well, it's not really the commissioner's because I don't control your money. So to alleviate all that, we have to keep it separate. That's my one. I, all the resources legally available, I would give you. But it's got to be done right, it can't just, and it's got to be transparent as well. That's it. Do we agree or disagree on this issue? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I kind of, Chris, that really answered one of my questions about ahead, the um, other county employees and, right. or, and or city employees. Because if they were doing that on, you know, on the clock, I'm just going to split their salary hourly or whatever, and they were doing something like that, they would be penalized if they got caught. That would just like be doing something personal when they ought to be doing their job. They do it every year. If you go to the Marble Festival and watch them set up for the Marble Festival, it's something that's done every well, year. I have enough time. People had friends set up there. So it's, it's something that's, that's set up. I, I did what I did with the uh, approval of my boss. I mean, I work for the sheriff, and the sheriff is the organizer of the event. And I helped to, to say I'll help run each event, and it was with his approval. So I've stood with him and, and went forward with it. So I'm not going to try to defend him on it, but I, I, I worked closely with my supervisor in the process. So you don't think nobody else should get in trouble for doing that? I, I think that that would Not be, just you or for yeah, the GPS. I, it, it would depend on the, the circumstances of how it was all put together. I mean, it, it, that's what I'm saying. It's done on a regular basis for other nonprofit events on a regular basis. This isn't the only event that it happens with. So I don't know how else to, 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 try, to, to try to show that. So. Thank you. I think on the county end, I'll just end it real quick. We're going to have a written policy that's online, and it's going to say, how events are done, whether you're a nonprofit, how, what we can do, what we can't do, what we will not do. And, and that's just going to be all end all. Um, that's as transparent as we can be with everybody. There's a written policy, this is the way it is, and it's the way it is for everyone. Um, but I can tell you that any theft of taxpayer money will be immediately you know, reported to our current sheriff, you know, Donnie Gregg. Um, it just won't be tolerated. I don't care if it's 10 cents for gum at the store, theft, theft. Uh, I saw someone else, ma'am, and sir. Uh, you're close enough, it won't take you long. long <laughs> You'll be next. So, just related to present discussion, Chief, this has been going on for nine years? Uh, well, 10 if you count the first ride. So, yeah. Okay. And I've been a firefighter for 20 years. We do boot drives, things like that, on duty for charity. Um, why is this issue? just now coming up in the ninth or tenth year of commingling 
if this event's been going on for almost a decade. Thank you. I was following Jeep Fest for years. Um, I, we take our family there. We enjoy it. Uh, I didn't probably start paying attention to Jeep Fest till my son plays travel ball, so we're always gone in September on Labor Day um, for the last nine years. But the last two years, he didn't play, so we got to go. Um, I started looking into it, I think, from information given to me. And at first, it was a, a year ago, it was even worse than what I saw. And then I started putting some pieces together. But there's a difference between, I guess it's the, I think Chris hit the nail on the head when he said it's warped into something they possibly never saw coming. I don't know how many Jeeps he started with the first year. I don't know. Maybe you can answer that real quick. A hundred and... What, 2,500 now? Yeah. That, that's a huge event. And that's why I applaud him for putting it on. So maybe there's some things that need to be reworked, I, I don't know, to alleviate all this discussion. Mr. Stanton, you want to repeat the phone? No, I'm good. Okay. All right, sir. Okay, well, let's go to it. Since a little bit different, but regarding transparency, uh, one of the things that uh, that I have and uh, encyclopedia of knowledge, if you will, um, is the fact that around about 75 percent of the working people in Pickens County work outside of Pickens County. So basically, the people and we're not talking about Cherokee County; we're talking Cobb County, um, Fulton County, the town, other counties, and so forth. There. And one of the challenges, and I, I admit I'm not in that, I'm not in that um, um, percentile because I'm lucky enough where I can work from home. Um, however, one of the problems that I'm seeing is the fact that the county it seems to be operating uh, somewhat in a what I call an eight to five environment. It's very difficult to get information, be able to uh visit meetings and other things of that sort when you have a meeting at 4 30 in the afternoon and you complete it by five o'clock so what i would like to see is the next commissioner uh put in the policy in place that would allow for one for the work meetings to be held say at 6 or 6 30 p.m and then allow for the general uh commissioner meetings be held at 7 or 7 30 p.m now, I understand there are some challenges with some department heads and some other folks that work overtime or the fact that some of these folks do even come at 7 o'clock in the morning um, and then, you know, happen to stay over. But I still think there should be some sort of flexibility for those folks. But I think that if we want to encourage more people, uh, especially for those that are working outside of the county, to be able to participate in the county, uh, that the county needs to be uh, more transparent. Uh, in terms of their website and making sure that the website is up to date and has current information uh, and as well as being able to hold meetings and other activities in which a, an employee can I mean, in which a person who lives outside the county is able to participate in that i'll give a beside the commissioner meeting i'll give the example of the open house at the public course complex nice facility for what i look like but unfortunately some of us have to work for a living we can't be there on a friday morning or a thursday morning we need to be holding these events on a saturday um, that allows for the citizens of pickens county to be able to view trans um, be able to be transparent and as well as communicate with the uh leaders and i'll just step up I don't care. Uh, go over here. For sure. Uh, first of all, the public works, they didn't advertise, I don't think, because of COVID. I don't think they wanted a lot of people. I was told that while we were, Mr. Stencil and I both were there. Um, so, uh, but transparency is that I've already touched on. Uh, one of the things I want to do is incorporate any kind of social platforms we can into these meetings, whether just because we got COVID now doesn't mean we've got to stop using Zoom or live events or whatever we need to do um, honestly a lot of people ask for what you're asking for but then they don't participate uh, if you look at the city of jasper two week a week ago they had a zoom meeting and uh, they had an early morning meeting where no one showed up for a 56 percent tax increase and that evening only one person showed up who's in this audience and i was on the zoom call 
That's a huge increase for people. Now, I think some of it, the, the, the community feels that they don't have an input and it's not going to matter. But I can promise you, if I'm elected chairman, it will matter. Um, so we've got to change that to make you feel welcome, make you feel like you have an input, and make you feel like you have a voice in this community. And it's not just three people sitting up on a pedestal calling the shots. Um, but again, going back and just trying to use any kind of means possible to make sure that you feel like you're interacting with us and our website, uh, definitely want to make it where we can go 24-7 on certain things where you can chime in, whether it be creating tickets for repair or trash notices and things like that. So I, I agree with you. I think that we've got to find ways to provide more opportunities for people to get involved. But I also agree with, with David when he said that we do right. things and people don't show up. So right. you've right. got to and you've got to find what's going to work, and I right. think that's and, it. And I think the problem is that we have. And I'm sorry, Larry, but I'm standing in the podium. But that's what, what I'm. What I, I guess the whole thing is is like a, you know, I, I know people that do work in Atlanta. They come up here, yeah. and then there's an event or there's something or whatever, and they don't. And they're not aware of it. And the first thing they do is they hit me up and say, "What's going on?" And um, and so you know, I think part of it is a culture, and I think the second part is just a communication that you know we are going to have our meetings there and, and things of that sort. I, I I understand. You know, I see the level of particip participation being very low, volunteerism being low, all these other things, but. You know, you're not going to know unless you try. Right, right. Well, we sure. found out when they tried to raise, when they, they raised the military a few years ago, that was the most packed meeting up in this room. So I think that you've got to experiment. You've got to be willing to constantly try to find ways that work. You've got to work with the, the other commissioners to make sure they can be involved. Uh, I know that, the, that both of us have talked throughout our campaign about wanting to host town halls, wanting to use technology, wanting to do as many things as we can to get in front of as many people as we can move those around from neighborhood to neighborhood to where we're in different parts of the county so that we're not constantly inviting people to come here but we're going out to where they're at uh, and and be willing to listen be willing to listen to the complaints and to the suggestions um, and take those so that we can continue to be better so i'm, I'm with you 100 percent were you just talking about government events or were you mixing private in there too you kind of said something well, I, I would say over, I mean, like the government on? events, like for example, the county has a work session uh, first Thursday of the month at 10 in the morning, that type of thing, they go to the department heads or whatever. I can't break from my work to come there, listen to 15 minutes and then go on. But if I'm going to be able, but I would rather hear what's going on down the pipeline in a work session <coughs> rather than just you know, have to go speak and say, well, I think that's, you know, not right. Um, so, I mean, overall, it is county government. But yes, there are some civic entities as well that are kind of limiting themselves by doing like a lunchtime event, that type of thing there. But for the purpose of this meeting, this was gov about government events like the fire station being open, the other things of that sort because that builds credibility and that builds PR and so when when they do say yeah we're going to do this for the fire department they say hey my kids came up there and they got to sit in the fire truck and they like that or being able to see you know the brine uh sit, you know the the brine machines you know when they have their winter storms hey we got brine machines here you know ready for us that type of thing there the the I hate to say it, but I think that the level of credibility is kind of, not just in Dickens County, but uh, countrywide, if you will. And so you have to go and show, hey, this is what we're doing for you. And being able to, like I said, have meetings where you can get more people involved and engaged. Yeah, I just real quick, I, I think we can do something real quick, a community calendar or something like that on the government side and utilize some of the new technology, work with the sheriffs and, and other elected officials that maybe, you know, mass email, mass text to, to remind you that things are going on and then try to be a little bit more flexible with some of the time. Because I'll tell you, even running for office, 
there's been Thursdays where I'm like, oh, there's a big, because this thing we do call life is flying by and you just forget. Right. So uh, a text during the day, hey, there's a BOC meeting or a BOE meeting or a, you know, whatever the sheriff's department's meetings I have. So we can try to utilize that too in our technology. Well, I suggest that master sir, calendar. Sir? Yeah. We're, we're okay. running out of time here. Yeah. We do want, <laughs> as Mr. Schaaf said, life sort of just. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Republican State Representative Rick Jaspers encouraging you to get out and vote Pickens County. Let's get it done, either by absentee, early, or in person. Don't let your voice be silenced. We do want to uh, reserve a little time for the candidates to make the closing comments. Uh, they're allowed uh, three minutes for that. And let me see, I believe I started Mr. Schaus. So Mr. Stance, will you go first? Follow yep. Mr. Schaus. So as, as we said when we opened up, I just want to say thanks. Thanks, Mr. Cavender, for uh, being willing to moderate and sit here. I know after watching the presidential uh, debate last week, that had to be an intimidating, daunting task to know that you were going to sit between two candidates after watching that. But uh, you, I think you've done an exceptional job. Thanks to the progress for hosting it. Thanks to everybody again for coming out or for watching watching after this gets posted. Uh, we've, we've been back and forth. I know that... Uh, as a nation, we've watched as our country has been split apart. We've watched uh, whether it was Democrat and Republican or whether it was a mask or no mask. Or we've seen nothing but fighting constantly for about a year. And I think that I speak on behalf of a lot of people when I say oh, we're really tired of it. Uh, we really just want to see some healing take place. We want to see a community that can come together. I know that we're going to have a difficult time as a nation trying to get past and bringing that together. But I think locally we've got to find a way to come together and start working together. I know that uh, there's a, an old African proverb, and I, I originally put this in to use, and then I found out it was used by another presidential candidate years ago. So I'm, I'm not referencing it from that. I just found it in a, in a quote somewhere. But it says, if you want to go quickly, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. I think if we can find a way to heal, and we can come together, and we can bring things together, we can start moving things forward. We can start working together as government along with developers. We can start working together as government along with homeowners. We can start working together as government along with everyone who calls this place either home, work, or the place that they love to come and play. So one of my key things that I wanted to do throughout the beginning for about a year and a half now that this campaign has been going on is to find ways that we can start coming together, that we can start getting all of our elected officials to actually start sitting down in the same room at the same time and find ways that we can all share a common vision that we're all on board for just because it's the best thing for the citizens of Pickens County. Not for anybody's personal gain. Strip all egos away, and even if you can't take away everybody else's ego, you can take away your own. Don't care who gets credit, but make sure that what we're doing, we're doing because it's what's right, period. We need to do the right thing because it's the right thing. Not because somebody can get credit, not because somebody can get reelected, not because somebody can gain financially, but because it's the right thing. And I think if we start to do that, we'll start finding ourselves in positions to where developers can start to be profitable, real estate agents can start to be profitable, and we can all find a way that we're going to work together. I think that we're on the brink of incredible things, I think, with changes that have happened in leadership throughout the city and throughout other locations, that we've got great opportunities in front of us. We're booming, we're sitting right on the tip of the scale, and we're just waiting to take one step forward for great opportunities for our community to become better. That we have a chance that we can leave this community better than the way we found it. The way we came into it, that we can leave something that's a legacy for our children and for our children's children. And it's just going to require us coming together. And I, I know that that sounds trivial, but at the same time, if you look at how much infighting has gone on over the last year, and look at how it's affected every one of our moods, if we spend time on social media for one hour a day, just think of how much it affects your mood by the end of that time that you're on social media. Because there's so much that's going on. And I think that we've got that opportunity. I think that we're looking down the pipeline that 2021 can be the, the, the new brink, the new opportunity for us to move forward, that we can make things happen. So I'm coming to you tonight. I'm sincerely asking you for your support. I'm asking for your prayers. But I'm also asking for your vote in November. I'm, I'm looking forward to an opportunity to continue to serve Pickens County just from another another opportunity in a different place. Mr. Schaus, your closing comments? Yeah, I'm going to change mine up a little bit. We kind of kept things uh, pretty classy here, but 
You know, I was supposed to retire this year. When I say retire, it doesn't mean quit working. It just means I was going to be able to do what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't need any more income, and we were going to go travel around the country and, and look at this beautiful country with our, our children before they got too big. I just see an opportunity to use a lot of assets that I have to reach out to people and bring what we need to this community in a streamlined, controlled asset growth-based program. I've done some great projects in this community. I've had a lot of fun. I've met a lot of people. But I've seen everything that's wrong with every little piece of it, from our children not having jobs to people feel that they're not treated equally, to people thinking they don't even have a shot to do something. And that's not what Pickens County is. Pickens County is a very close-knit, I'll take my shirt off your back and help you community. And right now, we're not that. Um, so what I, what I offer is to be able to make the things that I hear everyone saying they want happen. Working with the other two commissioners, I'm pretty much about as low-key, laid-back as they come when I'm really doing the business. I hate the politics. I hate the rest of it. I like to work. I like to roll my sleeves up and go to work, and that's what I want to do for this county. So I hope that some of you will consider voting for me. I'm not here for recognition. I'm not here for pictures. Uh, I'm not here for the money or self-gain. I'm here to improve this county and lay a successful foundation for our future generations. I've got my kids growing up. I, well, one of them's already grown up. And then I've got my grandkids growing up. So it's very important that the town I live in is being ran successfully. The other counties I develop in, I'm not that way with. But this county I am. So I hope to get, earn your votes uh, on November the 3rd. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chow. Thank you, Mr. Stansel. Y'all made my job easier tonight. And thank y'all for coming. I'm sure that. Uh,